and uh, in, in respect of Book of Acts, we'll, we'll kind of go backwards and forwards there with that one as well throughout. So, uh, Acts chapter 13 in the New Testament and 1 Samuel 16 in the Old. So 1 Samuel chapter 16. <coughs> First Samuel 16 in the Old Testament, and uh, we'll read that second, but first of all we'll go to Acts chapter 13. It's interesting, isn't it? Now, you can open in two different, completely parts, two different, complete, completely different parts of the Bible, and yet they both relate to each other. Amen. Much so. yep. It's the Word of God, that's the way it works. And uh, Acts chapter 13, verse, just two verses, verse 21 and 22. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, Acts 13 verse 21 and 22 reads, And afterwards they desired a king, and God gave, them, gave unto them Saul, the son of Sis, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, by the space of forty years. And when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfil all my will. Now, go across to 1 Samuel 16. And 1 Samuel 16, just uh, verse 11 through to verse 13 reads, uh, And Samuel said unto Jesse, uh, Hear all thy children. And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest, and behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. And he sent and brought him in, now he was uh, ruddy and withal of a beautiful countenance and goodly to look to. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Raymond. Let's pray. All right, Father, we do thank you, Lord, for your grace and mercy. Thank you that we can... Uh, once again be here th uh, this morning to uh, Lord just come aside from the world to delve into the riches of your word and uh, Father I uh, Lord just do ask that you would lead and guide through the Holy Spirit of God uh, Lord help us all individually to get from your word this morning what you would have us to get and uh, Lord I, I just thank you for what you will do Lord we do ask and pray these things in the name of of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, so in these two places, as you, as you can see, they both relate to uh, to David. Uh, in 1 Samuel 16 is uh, where Samuel the prophet was sent to, to anoint him. And Acts chapter 13 is talking about how God saw David and why he uh, chose him. Uh, you know, because he was a man after God's own heart and fulfilled all his will. Now, <clears throat> In Acts chapter 13, uh, we see you know, the Lord talk of David, and, as well as in 1 Samuel. Uh, and David was to be the second king of Israel. The second king of Israel. Saul was the first king. And, um, and so the Lord was after a man that would fulfill his will. Uh, and uh, especially because uh, you know, it, it, it was for his chosen people, the nation of Israel. Now, the will of God in respect of an individual means what God determines he would have in that individual's life, in living for him, in what they become, etc. And uh, what he would have them to do, what, what he has planned for them to do. Now, in that text verse, by putting them together, we can see in respect of David that all, we can see that all of what the Lord had for his life, because of his heart towards God, was fulfilled. And I want to sort of just get some... Um, some facts from these, from these verses first, and then we'll have a couple of points. So first of all, Saul, who was the first king of Israel, failed through disobeying the Lord. And that meant that his family, uh, from, from his son onwards, uh, would not retain the, the, uh, the kingdom, uh, the, the kingship, I should say, in Israel. And so David, of course, was to be the next one. So that's because of disobedience. Number two, uh, the Lord sought out someone after his own heart, as I've already said. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, Samuel the prophet had actually said that to Saul uh, at one of the times where, where Saul had disobeyed God. 
and uh, he literally said that the Lord had sought him out a man after his own heart. So he told Saul that fact. So Saul's on the on you know on guard from that point of time onwards. Uh, number three, uh, that one, the, the one that was uh, chosen of the man after God's own heart was David, of course, who at the time Samuel anointed him was a uh, a youth or a or a stripling, as uh, Saul called him, uh, over in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 33 and 56. That was the time of, of Goliath, when Goliath was uh, defying Israel and uh, speaking against the Lord God. Uh, David came along and uh, went to Saul to, uh, to to take up the challenge, and uh, and Saul called him a, a youth and a stripling, basically the same thing. It means uh, somebody that's just going from from boyhood to manhood. So in those you know, early teen years, there somewhere. And uh, <clears throat> number four, despite being anointed at that young age, David did not become king until the age of thirty. And that's found in Second Samuel chapter five, verse four. Now, uh, and even then, when he became king, it wasn't over all Israel for another seven years. He only had a partial rule at the first seven. Number five. David had learned early in his life to trust the Lord for the completion of his will. He'd learned early in his life. You know, uh, for example, you know, sorry, that is, you know, David did not go and, and struggle uh, within Israel to gain the leadership of Israel, but just let the Lord work about fulfilling, fulfilling his will. You know, Samuel came along, he's only a young, young guy, he's only a stripling or a youth, uh, the Lord gets Samuel to anoint him, and uh, and then time goes along. He has the battle with Goliath. He he starts to um, serve the Lord by uh, Saul drawing him in, drawing him into his um, into his inner circle. And he was you know, in charge of leading the the, uh, the the children of Israel's army out to to fight uh, those that would uh, defeat them. But then things went pear shaped, and Saul started to to persecute him uh, and, and to, to the extent of trying to kill him. But David, David was he, was, he was, he was okay with that. David just kept on going. He didn't struggle within Israel to try and gain the leadership from Saul, even though he knew uh, that he was the next king. He was already, already anointed to be the next king of Israel. Uh, in 2 Samuel chapter seven, uh, later on in David's life, he's already, you know, this, by this time he's already become the king well and truly, and uh, it's later, later on in his kingship that we see David uh, desire to build the ultimate place of worship uh, for the Lord, that is the temple. And uh, we know the Lord didn't allow him to do that uh, because he'd been a man of war, he'd been you know, leading the army of Israel to defend Israel throughout his life. And so, uh, uh, you know, the Lord didn't allow it to happen. But David, uh, the Lord, sorry, the Lord made David uh, the man after his own heart that fulfilled uh, all his will, he made him everlasting promises. And so David uh, has a big part of God's purpose, and we'll think about that in a moment, but you know, the, the fifth fact that we're looking at there, when the Lord anointed, had David anointed, those things happened with Saul, uh, things went you know, from bad to worse, in his relationship with Saul. Saul's trying to kill him for a number of years, perhaps around 10. Uh, <clears throat> David didn't try to agitate to do that, which he wanted to do, which he knew that he was anointed to be. Uh, later on with the, with the temple as well, David was told, no, you can't build it because you've been a man of war, but your son will. He didn't kind of go, well, you know, fair go, you know, I've really done a lot for Israel. I, I'm going to, you know, I, I think I should be able to do this. No, he didn't. He, he accepted God's will for his life. Now, I, I want to just have a bit of a quick uh, think about this for a minute. Uh, you know, David didn't struggle to become the leader of, of Israel. He, uh, he, he, he didn't struggle to, to build a temple uh, when, when the Lord said no. He was just accepting of God's will and God's time in all these things. So point number one, Point number one is this. God has a particular will for each one of our earthly lives with eternity in view. But 
not necessarily for your life to be what the world would look at as being a roaring success. You stop and you think about David before he became a king. You know, the people admired him. You know, he was really standing up for the Lord, full of zeal, full of enthusiasm for God, <clears throat> defending Israel. And, uh, and the people loved him. But then Saul turned against him and, and unjustly persecuted him. But you know, uh, David, David wasn't worried about what the world thought. He was still worried about what God thought. When the, when the situation with the temple arose later on in his life, the ultimate act of worship for God was, would have been to build that temple. It's never like at you too. Crank up the air kind of thing. Um, you know, with the temple, the same thing. And so he wasn't worried about what everybody else thought. He just accepted what God wanted him to be. Now, I want to go to Ephesians chapter 1, and this is where we're going to look at a little bit more about David. So Ephesians chapter 1 in the New Testament. I want, I want, to, I want for us to get what uh, David would have got. I want for us to get what the uh, people like the Apostle Paul who wrote the book of Ephesians under the inspiration of God. I want us to get what these different, these different heroes of the faith, what they, what they understood, what they got about the will of God. And so uh, we're thinking about this in relation to, to this point. Ephesians chapter 1. We've got to look at why the will of God for our lives individually is important. And it's, it's right there on the wall. It's all about the eternal purpose of God for eternity. You know, you might think that your life is, is rather insignificant and it doesn't really matter what you do. As long as you live the, the Christian life, then, then uh, that's, that's enough for God. Well, no. No, the reality is that we are all part of God's eternal purpose. Every one of us. If we're born again, if we've truly trusted Christ as our Saviour, then God wants you, He wants me, to be like David, to, to have a heart fully given to God, that we might fulfil all His will, because we are all part of God's eternal purpose. Now looking at Ephesians chapter 1, first of all, Ephesians chapter 1, look at verse number 10, it says that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, and I'll, I'll just give a bit of a, a, an explanation on that in a moment, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, uh, even in him. So in other words, there's going to come a time in the future, basically, basically the culmination of everything, where the Lord's going to gather together all of those that have truly trusted the Lord Jesus as their Saviour, trusted the Lord uh, throughout history, basically, uh, he's going to gather them all together for the culmination of it. Why? Because that's the goal. The goal is not to have uh, an earth that goes on for forever. Not this earth to go on forever. But his goal is for there to be as many people from this earth come to know him as their saviour and we're going to spend eternity together with him. That's God's eternal purpose. God's eternal purpose is not for you and I to necessarily, well, it can be, uh, not for you and I necessarily to be a roaring success in business or whatever it might be. Um, if God blesses you in that way, well, praise the Lord, that's good. I'm not, not speaking against that. But the, the, the thing that we need to realise is that success is being part of God's eternal purpose. This is what he's trying to do. He's trying to gather together as many from this world that will trust him as their Lord and Saviour so that in the dispensation of the fullness of times when that comes uh, he can gather them all together and, and we're going to spend eternity with them that's what it's all about our view should not be how can we make the next million dollars or the next five dollars whatever the case may be it should be having in mind Firm in our eyesight the eternal purpose of God. And that's what it's called. If you have it in Ephesians chapter 3 and verse number 11, Ephesians 3 verse 11, it says, according to the eternal purpose 
which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's where our theme came from. And that, that's putting a name to what we saw in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 10. It's not about success in the physical sense. It's about success in the spiritual sense. And that will come about by, uh, by us individually being able to be led by the Lord to do his particular will for our lives. And so whatever the Lord has for your life, it is ultimately aimed at being an effective part of God's eternal purpose. And I want to give you a couple of examples, um, uh, one from each extreme uh, in life. Uh, this is more recent history. Uh, so a fellow by the name of R.G. Laitono was an American who came from just an average background. Uh, when he started out, he, he wasn't, wasn't anything special. But in his early adult life, he had a passion to build earth-moving equipment. And I think mainly it was just for himself to do contracts that he was going to, that he was trying to get. But uh, in his early life, in his early years in that business, he struggled. He struggled. And uh, so eventually he, uh, he made the, the Lord his, his partner in his business. And, uh, and he made the Lord some, some genuine promises at that time. Now he went through some struggles through the years, up and down, and even when he made these promises to the Lord, talking financially. Uh, but as time went along, the Lord started to, to bless his business, and Laterno ended up becoming a, a famous um, person in the sense that he had, at one stage, 300 patents. Now the figures are uh, that in World War II, 70% of earth-moving equipment and engineering vehicles used by the Allies in World War II were designed and built by him. Now that's pretty successful. And that's what I'm saying. It's, it's not, not that God doesn't want people to be successful, but it's if we are successful according to the plan and the will of God for our lives. That's the key. And, uh, and so uh, he went on to, you know, to design much earth-moving equipment. He sold the business a number of years after the war and started to do other things and, and was successful in that as well. And so with his success, uh, he came to understand that his success, because of the pledge that he'd made to God, uh, was because of God. And what he pledged was 90% of his profit went back to the Lord's work. 90%. Now, whenever he would get slack on his promise, uh, his business would start to go like that. And, he, and the Lord would go, wait. Remember why I'm blessing you in the first place? Yeah, okay, Lord God. And he used to go around and he used to used to uh, visit churches. He used to you know speak at different churches and stuff like that as well. He had a real, real heart for the Lord. We'd never work on Sunday. He, the, in the in the building, sorry, the construction industry in those days, uh, Sunday was normally they, they would work in that industry in America. And uh, and so, uh, but he he refused. And God blessed him. God blessed him for that. Now, he went on you know, and, and, he, and he continued to, for the rest of his life to serve him the Lord as, as he could. So there's one extreme. There's, an ex there's, there's somebody who's come from just an average background and, uh, and God's blessed him in, in a mighty way because he did what God wanted him to do. That was the will of God for his life because the Lord looked down and he knew that he could trust uh, RG to do what he wanted him to do. He knew he could trust him to be faithful to his promise, uh, to his pledges with what he was going to do with the, with the, with the big prophets that God gave him. And uh, he had a heart for God's word, uh, work I should say, and for his heart, he had a heart for God's eternal purpose. And that was to, to see people come to know the Lord. Now we can look at the other extreme and think of somebody like Gladys Aylward. Gladys Aylward was just a, a, common, uh, a common person in England. Uh, very poor. Uh, she worked as a chambermaid, uh, like, just like a maid in a house. But God, at one stage, laid on her heart that he wanted her to serve him uh, as a missionary in China. She'd heard about this lady that was in China. She was already getting a bit older and, and she needed help. And the Lord laid on her heart to, to, to help her. Now Gladys Aylward applied to a missionary society there and, uh, and she was deemed to be unsuitable for the mission field. Uh, she, couldn't, she couldn't do it. Now, 
Gladys never became well off to be able to pledge to give generously like RG did, but she gave herself to God to use in serving Him. Now, Gladys Aylwood, she knew what God had, had shown her. He, she knew that where God wanted her to be. And that's the whole thing with the will of God, uh, it's, it's knowing clearly what God is, is, is laying before us. But how did she get there? She was a maid. Uh, she couldn't afford to, to cat, you know, buy a ticket to go on a ship. She wasn't going to be sponsored by a missionary society. And so as a maid, she, she chipped away and saved and saved and saved just a little bit all the time until she could afford a train fare, which took her up right down, right through um, you know, places which are not so safe these days, Siberia included, uh, went, went through there and, and into the top of China from there. Now, that wasn't an easy journey. It was fraught with difficulties and dangers. Uh, she found herself in, in the middle of a war zone in Siberia at one stage and fell asleep uh, on, the, on the train track, beside the train track in the snow in Siberia uh, because the train wasn't going anywhere. It had only had troops on it and they were all looking at her as if to say, what are you doing up here? And they stopped at the war zone and, and at, at the front, or near the front, and so she had to walk back to civilization. Hence, she fell asleep beside the, beside the railway line <coughs> in the snow. But you know, through all of the things that happened, and that's only a little bit, God got her to the mission field that, that she was called to, clearly called to. Now, Gladys didn't ever have, you know, become well-known and famous in the sense of becoming wealthy or anything else, not at all. But she fulfilled the will of God. She found the lady that, that she uh, was going there to, to help and when she got there, the lady was kind of like, what are you doing here? But you know what? Did she give up? No, she didn't. She kept on in China. She, she helped this lady. The work grew. And, uh, and uh, God blessed her. Why? Because she had a heart for God. And she fulfilled His will for her life. Her life didn't have the impact that the way R.G. Leiturnos did. But it was one of serving the Lord, perhaps even more sacrificially, as she literally placed her life into, into the Lord's hands and experienced great danger. To serve Him, according to His will, for her part in His eternal purpose. Brethren, we've all got a part in God's eternal purpose. If you are born again, if you have the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Saviour, you have a part in God's eternal purpose. It may be uh, helping with ministries in this church here, helping to reach out to people in Bundaberg, people that you come across, people that you know. They're all, they've all got a soul. They all need the Lord. You know, the Lord knows what He has for your life. So David the shepherd boy, for example, called from the hills of Bethlehem, from tending, his, to, tending to his father's sheep, to ultimately being king of Israel. Wow, that's a big change. He was only, a, like I said before, only a, a youth, a young youth. And he fulfilled all the will of God for his life. And what did it lead to in respect of God, in respect of the eternal purpose of God for his life? Well, like I was saying before, 2 Samuel 7, that he's there, he's been king of Israel for a number of years. He, He's sitting in his house of cedars, as it says there at the beginning of chapter 7. He's comfortable. This little shepherd boy has become king of Israel. He's in his 30s by this time, or maybe even 40s. And, uh, and he's looking at the window. He's thinking about the ark, of, the ark of, God, of God, the covenant of God, sitting in a tent. And he's in, he's in comfort. He was a man after God's own heart. He's got the eternal purpose of God in mind. You might say, well, what was that? He, he, he desired for the ultimate place of worship for his Lord and his God. A place of worship that, that, that would promote who the true God of heaven and earth is. Above all of the false gods that, that, that were around at that time. Look, this all around these days. That's what, that's what his goal was, as part of, part of God's eternal purpose. 
But the Lord said, no, 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 David, you've been a man of war, so you, you, can't, you can't do that. Uh, but your son will. But have a look at this. I, go over to Psalm 89 and also Acts 13. Go back to Acts 13 if you still watch your place there. But go Psalm 89 first. Psalm 89. Now, here is David. His heart is for God. His desire is just to do whatever God wants in his life, to fulfill the God's will for his life. Why? Because he's got an eternal view on, on how things all go. And in Psalm 89, Psalm 89, have a look there in verses 1 to 4. I'll read all four verses. Psalm 89, verse 1 to 4, it says, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. For I have said, Mercy shall build up forever. Thy faithfulness shall thou establish in the very heavens. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn unto David thy servant. Thy seed will I establish forever and build up thy throne to all generations. To all generations. It wasn't just for David's sons to inherit the, the, uh, the throne of, of Israel or the kingdom of Judah as it, as it later became when the, when the nation split. He's talking about that forever. God made promises to, to David because he was a man after God's own heart that fulfilled all his will, that had, that had the, the ultimate purpose of the worship of the almighty God of heaven and earth uh, as his priority in life. Eternal purpose. Because of that, God made David promises. They call the sure promises of David in the Old Testament. Now, uh, go back to Acts chapter 13. Our text verses. Acts 13. Now, instead of looking at verses 21 and 22 this time, but let's look in 22 and 23. Verse 22, it says, And when he had removed him, talking about Saul, he raised up to them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. Now look at verse 23. Of this man's seed hath God, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a Saviour, Jesus. Talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. What a, what, what a blessing. In other words, what that means there in verse 23 is that because of who David was, the Lord Jesus Christ was in the lineage of David. When you look at the old, I'll get back to that in a minute, but when you look at the kings in the Old Testament, uh, after David, they are often compared to David. He is the, he is the gauge. You know, where, where a king did right, if he was really wholeheartedly serving the Lord, uh, though, you know, the Lord would have in the word of God, uh, he did right in the eyes of God according to uh, how David his father had done. Uh, if, they, if, they were, if they were doing okay, but they didn't do everything the way God wanted, uh, they he would say you know, they did right in the eyes of God, but not uh, as David his father had done. Things like that. So David was the gauge. He was the ultimate. And, and so David became, uh, the, I'm not sure, I forget how many, how many, how many, um, you know, steps down the, the, his lineage it was, but the Lord Jesus Christ came from the lineage of David. God made him promises because he simply gave his whole heart to God, was only was focused on the entire will of God for his life. Let me just, let me just put that in other words for us today. The more you will give your heart to the Lord in your walk with Christ, the more, you, the more you desire and you, you actively seek for God to work in your life through the Holy Spirit of God to do His will for you personally, the more God's going to, going to use you and the more long-term eternal effect you will have because of that. You might say, how do you get that? Well, that's just what we're looking at. We all, I'm sure we all want for God to be well pleased with our lives. But has He got your heart? Is your desire just what He desires from your life? If you want blessing, 
we need to not look at what we want, but what God wants in life. That's what we see there. Uh, thinking about that still, go uh, to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah 9, have a look over there. In the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 9. Thinking of what we just saw there uh, in Acts 13 in relation to the Lord Jesus being of the lineage of David. In Isaiah 9, have a look at verses 6 and 7. Now this is a famous verse. These verses get trotted out every, every Christmas. And... Uh, People don't even think about what it means, but in verses 6 and 7 it says, For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And look at verse 7. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David, and upon his kingdom to order it, and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever. Uh, the, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Verse 6 is talking about Jesus being born into this world. First coming. And the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. It's talking about, that's, that's talking future tense talk. The everlasting kingdom of God. You see, uh, David, God used David as a central part of, of, of his plan. The increase of his government and peace shall be no end upon the throne of David. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord will come back. He will rule, he will rule his world. God will renew this world. Future tense. He'll recreate the world. Why? Because we've made a mess of it. But anyway, Revelation 19, when the Lord returns, He returns as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. There's the everlasting King. There's the, there's, there's the King that's talked about there in, in verse 6 about the government being on His shoulders, and the increase of His government, peace, uh, there shall be no end. That's talking of the Lord Jesus Christ. He'll come back as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. David, because he was a man after his own heart, after God's own heart, that fulfilled all the will of God. And those promises given to him. What a blessing. He went from being a, 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 an average poor shepherd boy on the, on the hillside looking after his dad's sheep, having the fight of the bear and the lion by the grace of God, to being King of Israel, just giving God his whole heart, doing everything that God wanted in his life, and God said, I'm going to bless you forever for that. Wow. How about you and I? How much, is, how much of our hearts has God got? How much? Point number two. If you're in the center of God's will for your, for your life, then no matter what he leads you through, uh, it is good for you. Now I've got, a, I've got a confession to make. The Sunday school lesson we started this morning, and I just I was looking at it on my computer the other day. I hadn't printed it out, and I was just looking there. Oh, that's a nice, that's a nice uh, book. If you're in the centre of God's will for your life, then no matter where what He leads you through, it is good for you. It is good for you. Uh, Acts chapter 13, verses 22 and 23. We've already been there, but you know. Uh, it's talking about David being, you know, taking over the throne of, of, uh, of Saul when Saul was gone. Uh, Saul died in battle uh, against the Philistines. And then David, David uh, became king. And, and the thing is, that was at the end of a long period of time, a number of years where David had been, had been floating around in the wilderness or running around in the wilderness trying to hide from Saul, perhaps around 10 years. Saul's trying to kill him. David's trying to be faithful to God, and he was. And so, uh, you know, you look at that time for David, it was a bad time. We would look at it and go, oh, that was really rough. And even David got tired of you. He ran off and hid down in the land of the Philistines just, just to get away from Saul. 
But you know what? It was good for him. It was good for him. And brethren, let me just say this. If God allows, if you have a heart for God and God allows things to happen in your life as you're attempting to, to live for him and to do his will, don't go, oh, why was me? Say, Lord, as far as I know, I'm living right for you. But just you've allowed this to, to still come to pass in my life. What, what do I do? What do I do? And, and so, you know, that, that was, there's a good example with David. Uh, at one particular point, uh, you know, David, as a young man, he's there, he's been anointed as, uh, as the next king. He's still a shepherd boy, but he, he, he's been anointed. Then along comes Goliath. David takes up the challenge. He goes to King Saul and he says, Look, Saul, uh, King, uh, the Lord's delivered me from the paw of the bear and the paw of the lion when I've been looking after the sheep on the hillside. And, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're pretty strong and you know, vicious beasts. And uh, I'm only a, you know, a lad. I'm only a youth. But God delivered me, delivered me and, and, and it's all good. God gave me victory over the bear and the lion. And this giant here, this Goliath that's defying God, same thing. God will deliver him into my hands. He trusted him. And so, uh, you know, David, at this point, he's full of zeal and he's full of enthusiasm for God, for the work of God. And so with full assurance, and the Lord David faced Goliath and, and God gave him the victory. At this particular point, David's got the, the world as his oyster, as the expression goes. Things are looking good. Saul takes him into his palace and says, you'll be like my son. And he and Jonathan, Saul's son, uh, they, were, they were like, you know, they were, they were so close together. And then Saul, as I've mentioned before, he turned against David and he was jealous of him and chased him all around the countryside for about 10 years or so. Trying to, trying to wipe him from the face of the earth. And uh, so you sit there and you go, how could that be good for David? Okay, well, let's have a look. 1 Samuel chapter 24. 1 Samuel 24. 1 Samuel chapter 24. In 1 Samuel chapter 24, let's have a look there in... Uh, verses 1 to 6, we won't read them all for time's sake, but if you have a look there in verses 1 to 6, uh, I'll run through and, and give a summary. So here's Saul, verse number 1. Uh, he's returned from following the Philistines, uh, and it was told him that David was in a particular place called En Gedi, there in the wilderness. So Saul takes 3,000 men out of Israel, good, you know, good Saul was chosen there, and, and he pursues David down to this particular place in En Gedi. And um, as we can see there, it's, it seems like it's a bit of a, a, bit of a rough place. But it says the rocks, upon the rocks of the wild goats. And so he came to the sheep coats by the way, and there was a cave, and Saul went in to cover his feet. In other words, uh, Saul went in there to sleep. Now what Saul didn't realise was that David was in the back of the cave with his men. They're hiding in the back of the cave because they must have seen that Saul was coming. And so Saul lies down and he covers his feet. He goes to sleep. He's, you know, he's making zeds there in the cave. Verse 4, And the men of David said unto him, Behold the day of which the Lord said unto thee, Behold, I will deliver thine enemy into thine hand, that thou mayest do to him uh, as it shall seem good unto thee. Then David arose and cut off the skirt of Saul's robe privily. Now, let's think about this. His men, what they are saying is, uh, David, uh, the Lord had said that he will deliver your enemy into your hands. Uh, David, uh, Saul is your enemy. He's been trying to kill you for years now. And, and if we keep going like this, one of these days he's going to get you. But God said he would deliver your enemy into your hands. Here he is. He's asleep. We're here. You've just got to get up and just, and it's done. But David rose up and just cut the edge of the skirt, like the edge of the skirt of Saul on his, on his, on his robe. Now look at, look at verse number uh, 5. 1 Samuel 24 verse 5 it says, And it came to pass afterward that David's heart smote him because he had cut off Saul's skirt. He hadn't killed him. 
wasn't going to do, wasn't going to do what his men wanted him to do. He just cut the skirt off, and his conscience bothered him about that. And so uh, here we have David, anointed to be the next king of Israel, being hunted like a beast in the wilderness for no other reason than Saul's jealousy towards him. And, and as, as Saul had figured that David was the man that, that God had chosen to replace him and his sons afterwards, uh, as Samuel had said. And with the knowledge that he'd been anointed to be king over Israel and that Saul had gone off the rails in this matter and was trying to, trying to kill him, and with David's men there urging him on to kill Saul, David not only did not kill Saul, but his conscience was smitten just by cutting off a bit of material. Which, by the way, he used to show Saul the next morning and say, Hey Saul, I could have done, I could have done you in last night. But have a look, see what we've got. And Saul, you know, raved on for a little while. So David having a, a heart after God's own heart, he looked at Saul there lying there in that cave and he went, that is still the Lord's anointed. And I'm not going to touch him. I'm not going to kill him. And he came to the point where, where it was no longer David just full of zeal and enthusiasm as he was in the days of Goliath. But David was now the mature David, who was not only a man after God's heart, own heart, wanting to do all of God's will for him, but a mature, responsible man that God could trust in fulfilling his will as king of Israel. You see, Saul's persecution of David was good for David. It was good for him. Brethren, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, is what the Word of God tells us. Don't think it's strange. Think, okay, God, what's, what's going on? We must first look inwards. Lord, have I caused this? And if we can't, if the Lord doesn't, doesn't lay anything on our hearts, well, Lord, then you knew. And God, you know the way through this. Lord, help me to learn the lessons from this that you want me to learn. Help me to grow. Don't just, Lord, I don't want to just be full of zeal and enthusiasm and, and be out there like a bull charging at the gate and do the wrong thing. We need to grow. It's good for us. He came, he'd come to that point and God blessed him for that. Oh yeah, yeah David still had a sinful nature like you and I do. Of course. But you know, David learned that all things do work together to good, for good to them that love God, to those, sorry, to them who are the call according to his purpose, Romans 8, 28. It's true. Let me just say this, if you're truly saved uh, this morning, if you've been born again, then you are called to the purpose of God, his eternal purpose. Let's close with Ephesians. Go, oh, sorry, Hebrews, I should say. Hebrews. Go to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews 11. Now, have a look over there. We'll start in verse uh, number 13. Hebrews 11, verse 13. This is talking about the Old Testament saints. Those that really believed in the Lord in the Old Testament. Verse 13, it says, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country, and truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. <coughs> Verse 16, But now, but now, they desire a better country that is in heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. Their focus was eternity. They're looking for the heavenly city. Yeah, I know we've got a life to live. I know we've got to have jobs and houses and, and all that stuff. I, I'm not, not saying that. 
But brethren, what's your focus? Is it you? Or is it your Lord? Is it the will of God? Has God got your heart? That's what it's all about. We're going to step off into eternity one day and the Lord's going to go, what part did you play in my eternal purpose? Jesus did it all. He's done it all for us. He went to the cross. He paid the price. He's given us the Holy Spirit of God to indwell every born-again believer to help us through this age, through our lives. Oh, don't miss the boat. In this day and age where the, the, the pull and the lure of the world is, is so so hard, so, so much, it's easy to get distracted by the wrong things. Keep your focus on God. Keep your focus on the eternal purpose. That's what it's all about. You might say, well, you don't know the problems I'm facing. No, but God does. You don't know what it's like. No, but God does. And there's been billions of people just like you throughout history that have experienced the same kind of grief, the same kind of troubles, the same kind of problems that you experienced. And God, if there were people that really trusted the Lord, like the, like the Old Testament saints here, God got them through. Why? Because they had a, the right focus. And we have the right focus. Give your life, give your heart to the Lord. And seek the will of God for your life. His entire will. Don't hold anything back from God. What's the point? You hold yourself back from God uh, and you just make yourself miserable. Honestly. Give yourself to the Lord. Be a man after be, be a, a man or a lady after God's own heart that will fulfill all his will. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for your grace and your mercy. Thank you, Father, for this time that we can be here. And, and Lord, to delve into your word. And Lord, it's so easy to get so wrapped up in our life and forget about the fact that, that you are in control of our lives. So Father, I just want to pray the Holy Spirit of God to, to work in our hearts individually. Lord, help us to be focused on the fact that you give us our next breath. And Lord, what else could there be except to, to give you our hearts, to, to, to yearn to do all of your will for our lives. Father, I just do, I will commit these things to you. I thank you, Lord, and I give them over to you in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to close with uh, hymn number 170. Hymn number 170. Hymn number 170. And as that's playing softly, uh, we'll have all heads bowed, all eyes closed. All heads bowed, all eyes closed at this time. It's like to stop and think about it. Has God got all their hearts? Has God got your heart? What is your focus in life? Is it to be, oh, yeah, I live the Christian life, or is it to be, no, I, I know the Lord is my Saviour and I just genuinely sincerely want to do all of his will for my life. I want him to have my heart. So with heads bowed, eyes closed, let, let's, let's seek the Lord at this time and, uh, and, and have some time with him. Let's pray.
you uh, want to continue to pray, please do so. Don't stop. I mean that sincerely. But if you are uh, finished, let's be upstanding. We're going to sing number 170. We'll sing uh, just a couple of verses, verse 1 and verse 5. <laughs>